I'm here to talk to you today about predictive analytics in the European economy. But before I do that, let me tell you a bit more about me. So I guess I look back at, at me, my life, and my career, and see things changing both in my life and my career as technology advances as data gets bigger. I started off 20 years ago. Life was a lot more simple then. Work was like no computer at home, just a computer in the office. No phones, just the landline in the office. And now, 20 years later, I look at it and I'm juggling. I'm juggling two kids, my job, my personal mobile, my work mobile, my landline, my email. And I haven't got time. So me, I've become much more demanding. I'm demanding of industries out there, of people interacting with me. I haven't got time to look around and work out what I want to buy, or what I want from my phone, or what I want from this shop. I want somebody to tell me what I want. I want people to work it out. I want more Amazon-like personalization around my experiences. I have no time to go and look for what I want. I want it now. When I look at my career, my first job, I started out at Barclays over 20 years ago. I was actually working in data as it was then, or little data as I like to think of it, building credit scorecards, using predictive analytics around one or two different sources of data to predict lending decisions for the bank, to predict who would be a good risk to take on, who would be a bad risk. It didn't actually take me very long to work out that I hated that job. It was the most boring job that I've ever done. Analytics is just not for me. I'm someone who wants to go out there and make it happen. <coughs> Whilst I was at Barclays then, that was my first interaction with FICO. Ironically, now, FICO, where I work, I run Europe, Middle East, and Africa. FICO is an analytics company, a big data company. We go out there and work with businesses around the world and help them to identify and retain their customers. We do that through showing them how to use data, how to make the most of it, how to apply analytics to it. And we've been doing that since the 1950s. What we do for our customers is we help them improve their engagement with their customers. We automate our decisions to make them happen more quickly and more widely. And we work with them to try and optimize those decisions to get a better rate of return. So all this data stuff, <coughs> it all sounds a bit big brotherish. What's important to me around the big data industry is that we all think about how we can use it responsibly, how we can use it fairly and consistently and appropriately to make the world a better place. We're now in the era of data analytics and big data. We've always had data, but now there is masses of it, absolutely masses. The Google CEO, Eric Schmidt, has actually said that the amount of data produced up to, up to 2003, we're now actually producing in days. We produced 5 billion gigabytes of data up to 2003. And now, in 2013, we produced that same amount in two days. But what's more, we're predicting that in 2014, we'll actually be producing that much every 10 minutes. That's a lot. So how do you go and make use of it? What we're seeing is the emergence of data-related roles across all industries. The number of data jobs in recent years has increased by over 15,000%. We have the chief data officer and we have data scientists. Data is very problematic and it requires huge skills to work out how to use it appropriately. 
What's important is that the data is clean, that the quality is good. If it's not, you're going to have problems with your analytics. You're going to have problems making the right decisions. If we look at the timeline of analytics and data, you can see that it started out in the 1930s. It was primarily governments who were using the data. That moved <coughs> in the 50s and 60s to research and larger corporations using base, basic analytic techniques such as linear programming. And then in the 70s and 80s, the analytics sort of hit the bigger companies. But by 2000, it was almost like big data, analytics, big bang. The, the analytics software market grew <coughs> from $11 billion to $35 billion over that period. It's huge. The users of the R programming language went from zero to a million users between 2000 and 2009. IBM spent $16 billion buying analytics companies between 2005 and 2012. And as we move forward, you can see that big data users, the analytics people, are going to become every single one of us. The availability of that data and the techniques to use it are become, going to gradually become available to all of us to use every day. So what is predictive analytics? To take it back to basics, it's really using data to answer a question. What's important is that you are very clear about the question that you're asking. Taking a simple example, banks have been using credit scorecards for years and years and years to predict who to lend money to, who's going to be a bad debtor in the future, and who's going to be a good <coughs> credit risk. They're using the data to work out the characteristics of what, of what those two groups of people are likely to be and making decisions against that. Why is analytics important? FICO recently worked with Forrester on a report, and they concluded that those companies that can recognize a change in behavior quickest will be the ones who are most likely to win in that market. So what does that mean? That means actually taking the data, the masses of different sources of data out there, working through it, working with it, making sense of it, applying the latest predictive techniques to answer that question, be it a lending decision in a bank or a health decision in the healthcare industry. And finally, getting that out to market quickly in as close to real time as you can. There's no point doing all those analytics or having all that data if you can't get it, it working there and then, if you can't get it impacting you now. And the closest to now, the ones that get closest to now, are the companies that are going to win. So I want to walk you through some examples of the use of big data, both from FICO, the company that I work for in Europe, and also broader examples. Let's start with Obama and his election campaigns. This second campaign was quite different from the first in terms of the amount of data scientists he employed and the amount of data he had at his fingertips. He was using that to answer two questions. The first, trying to predict who was going to vote for him. But the second, and probably more importantly in terms of the influence of the first, who was going to donate? Who was going to give him money? They actually started churning the data to an to identify the different segments of people, the different segments of voters in the US, and work out how to treat each of those segments. Let me give you one example. So they identified that one group of people who were very likely to donate was women in their 40s on the west coast of America. 
So to entice them to donate, they came up with a very, very good offer. They offered them the chance of dinner with Obama and George Clooney. Success story, straight away. A very, very personal, very, very tailored offer. It made a difference. Let's take um, a different example, a crime example. Let's take a scene out there in Mexico. We work with a company called Entercard out there in the Nordics and put it, um, have some pretty leading edge fraud solutions that we're, we work with them on. What we were able to do, well, what the solutions in place were able to do. John was actually sitting there, John the customer of Entercard, having his breakfast in a cafe in some down and out street in Mexico. He actually brought, bought his um, coffee, his breakfast, and his phone rang, his mobile phone. And it was that fraud analyst from Entercard over there in Sweden. Have you got your card? Yes, yes, I've just bought, I've just paid for my food, I've just paid for my coffee. Um, I'm a bit busy. But they were so they had seen so much from the data. They had seen a suspicious transaction on his card, even though he was out there in Mexico. So they were able to be a bit pushy and get him to actually physically check for his wallet. On doing that, it had gone. And he'd actually realized that the waitress that had spilt milk over him 10 minutes before had actually lifted his wallet and already been and made that transaction. But you can see the timeliness there. I mean, how pleased was he? He's then able to cancel all his cards. They've got a customer for life. It's going to take a lot to destroy that relationship. If we look at fraud and the evolution across Europe, um, you can map where fraud's increasing and fraud's decreasing using the data you've got available. The red is where, in the last 12 months, fraud has increased. The green is where it's decreased. <coughs> so you can see the UK and Germany, it's increasing. If you actually looked in the years prior to that, fraud in the UK, specifically, was actually decreasing. That was due to the combination of data and analytics, real leading-edge analytics, alongside chip and pin technology that were being used over that period in the UK. So the fraud across all different types of fraud actually fell significantly. And when fraud falls, it, it doesn't go away. It moves somewhere. It moves to where it's easier. If you compare that to Germany over the same period, Germany doesn't actually use the same techniques. It hasn't adopted the same solutions. It doesn't use chip and pin technology. Fraud grew over the same period, period as the fraudsters moved where it was easier to go. Another example is um, we've recently <coughs> been running some pilots here in the UK looking at how mobile phones and fraud in the card industry can actually help each other. We've actually been running pilots where we can see where you are um, in terms of where your phone is and comparing that to where the card is and actually able to tell that if your phone's in a completely different place that that, that card transaction might be suspicious. By doing that, you can actually improve, improve the number of frauds that you identify by about 70%. So it's actually really, really good prevention measure. Zuno, a direct bank in Central and Eastern Europe, they're actually using analytics out there in the cloud. Um, they're a direct bank that, uh, that lends online through digital channels. They've actually managed to use the most recent technology and the most recent analytics to reduce their time to market or time to lend down to minutes and days sorry, but to minutes and seconds from days. That's allowing them to lend more in a market that's very different to the one we know here in the UK. Another example, out there in Moscow, 
In Moscow, FICO has been working with the Credit Bureau, MBKI, it's the equivalent of Experian and Equifax over here in the UK. <coughs> For a while, we've had a FICO score that's used to predict risk decisions over there. But the Russian market is very difficult, different. It's full of people who are young and want to borrow. It's a growing economy, so the lenders want to lend more. But they want to do that in a, non, in a way that's, that's not increasing the risk. What they found is that by using connected data, and by that I mean data about everybody in my household, they can actually improve the predictiveness of the score by 11%. That's significant for that economy. It means we can lend more, the economy will grow, and it will fuel economic growth. A totally different example, one that to me I think is quite, quite important and quite key is the use of data. In Canada, they've been using big data and predictive analytics to actually spot infections in premature babies. They're using 16 real-time streams of data around the vital signs of those babies. That's a thousand, more than a thousand data points per second. And it's showing correlations. It's actually showing that the vital signs of those babies actually stabilize they stabilize rather than deteriorate before you get a major infection. That's totally contrary to common sense and a real key example of how using data can actually save lives if you use it in the right way. I guess what I'm, I'm trying to say is if data is used well, it can really drive the customer intimacy and businesses can win. I guess one day maybe we'll get to the point where you go to the ATM, you draw out some money, and we know that I need to buy some milk before I go home, <laughs> otherwise I'm not going to get that cup of tea. Will we ever get that far? I don't know. <laughs> so there we go. It's really us who are demanding that information. So in terms of data scientists out there, those, the number of those jobs is growing and growing. But what's important in terms of the people undertaking those roles is probably changed. So you do need those statistics and those mathematics degrees. You do need to be able to produce those predictive models using those techniques from, and degrees from colleges such as here, such as Imperial. However, combined to that, with that, you actually need those business-facing skills you need to be able to be inquisitive, to focus on problem solving, to really know how to explain these things in a, a simple, easy to understand way. And it's the combination of the two that are gonna make the difference in, in industries and to us as customers who are demanding more. There's going to be more and more jobs across this industry and I do hope that some of you are interested in careers in that industry. I guess my key message is it's very important to me, for me, for you, for, the, for my children, that we use data responsibly and fairly. <coughs> I think there's four ways that we can actually use it. Um, as a business, and this is something that I really try to push from a FICO perspective, we all want decisions about us to be fair. We want them to be objective. I don't want my telephone company to give my husband a brand new mobile phone, but me to not deserve one. I want those decisions to be objective. We can help businesses meet people's needs. And us as individuals are really demanding that. We're demanding more and more knowledge about us as individuals and what we want. And that in turn will help promote economic growth around the world. But most importantly, 
we have to protect the rights of individuals, protect their privacy, and understand the laws around the world and work within that, that remit. And then, ultimately, we end up with not the big brother of 1984, but that big brother we all know and love and want, the one that looks after us and is responsible and reliable and takes care of us and makes life better. Aizan from the MBA program. So maybe to carry on a little bit about the topic of the, the fair and objective use of big data and this quantified self-idea. Um, could you share a little bit more about what you think about insurers and other businesses using uh, credit scoring data like FICO data in doing in coming up with pricing and models with, uh, with end users? Okay, so um, to me what's starting to happen is the more traditional risk industry is starting to merge with the marketing industry. Um, so I guess that's been talked about for a while. But for the first time out there in the industry, I'm starting to see that the way you're using data isn't just to market more and to optimize those marketing decisions. It's to combine it with the risk data to not just market and sell more or to lend to the lower risk. It's to combine it to give the best value decision. Um, it's something that's been talked about for a long, long time, but it is actually starting to happen in practice. Because I guess with insurers, uh, the idea is that insuring someone with a strong fecal score should be someone who's you know, uh, less risky. So you could you know, tune your premiums the right way. Yeah, um, so the FICO score to dip traditionally predicts credit risk. Um, and it goes back to what is the question you're trying to answer. In insurance, it's a slightly different question. Sorry, I'm Jonathan. I'm here at Imperial. Um, I have a background in kind of quantitative finance. But I was a question about where you get your data from. Do you buy your data or do you collect it yourself and then, more importantly, clean it yourself? So we're not a credit bureau. We don't keep data. So we would contract with a a business or corporate, so say a, a bank, um, to build an analytical model. Um, they would give us a sample of that data, anonymized, and we would work it. Similar for insurance, similar. So you assume the data you take is clean already? <coughs> no, we then apply various techniques to, to check that and confirm that. Um, it's never clean. <laughs>